Roger Allers is a very multi-talented artist. He started in the 80s on a film called Animalympics, starring Billy Crystal and Gilda Radner. And on that, he was a triple threat. He was the art director, a writer, an animator. Throughout the 80s, he continued as an animator and a writer. And the Walt Disney Corporation picked him up as a concept artist for the film Tron. And at that time, uh, being a concept artist for a new art form called Candy Apple Neon, which no one had ever seen before, was quite an accomplishment because that form of art, as much of the art you saw in this film, was very unique. It was created by backlighting artwork and doing several exposures on top of itself to create that dynamic look. After Tron, Disney kept him on as a storyboard artist, so he began to work on films from the very inception in the story department as a storyboard artist on some films that you may have heard of, such as The Little Mermaid and Rescuers Down Under. And they kept him going further and made him a story supervisor in charge of story for Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and other films. So it's no wonder that after this run of hit films with Disney, he was assigned to be the director for one of Disney's most popular films, The Lion King. The Lion King has a worldwide gross of an incredible $952 million, just short of a billion, and it may have hit that at this point. So it is no surprise to me that this artist was given the ability to take care of the work of Khalil Gibran that has pleased readers for generations. These, these books were written in 1923. They're still in publication, and it takes an artist of this caliber to bring those words to life in this wonderful animated film. Your children are not your children. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. And what is it to work with love? Work is love made visible. And you are my messenger. Our host for the Q&A this evening is producer Tova Leiter. Tova's credits include Glory with Denzel Washington, Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonia Banderas and Madonna, and also Varsity Blues. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Roger Allers and Tova Leiter. Thanks. So this was the most unusual animated movie, very spiritual, um, taking, you know, the work of a uh, very famous poet and philosopher and artist, and um, the task of actually bringing it to life um, is challenging, to say the least. It was, it was. So, and I understand that a lot of artists were involved when, you know, he broke from the story into animation sequence of the poetry. It was done by different artists, right? From right. around the world. Right. Because you saw different styles going on there. Right. So tell me a little bit, uh, tell me, tell us, uh, <laughs> tell us, um, how did the movie happen and what was the challenges of bringing it to life, okay. really. Kind of the genesis of the whole thing. Go all the way back. Okay, I'll, I'll, no. I'll, be, I'll be brief and I won't go too far. It started off with two people in Ohio, uh, not in the movie business, who really were huge fans of Gibran's book and wanted to make a movie of him, of his book, The Prophet. They spent seven years getting the rights to turn the book into a movie because Gibran had given the rights at his death to his village in Lebanon. So there was a society in Lebanon that had to be formed to take uh, you know, control of this, and it took a long time, seven years to get the rights. Wow. They brought on a... Because a, of the seven years that he was in jail, so... <laughs> yes, that's it. <a>, but it <laughs> just harkened to the... It was actually Parma. because the, the membership of, of, <laughs> of that organization kept changing from year to year. So you could have people all agree oh. one year, and by the time you start getting the contract drawn up, the, the membership was all different. Anyway, 
So they managed to do it. Uh, they brought on a producer, uh, Clark Peterson, and uh, they had thought about making a live action film. And he, when, when the film, when the idea had, had changed to just the idea of just doing poems by different animators, Clark th thought about Fantasia. And he said, well, not by animators, uh, different poems. Yeah. He said, well, how, what about like Fantasia? Why don't we do it animation? Right. Which was a really radical idea, uh, which they got behind. And when Salma Hayek, who was another producer who came on, when she came on, she felt like just many, many poems all strung together, all different styles, is gonna be a lot for people to slog through. Yes. So she felt like it needed a stronger narrative, and that's when they approached me uh, to take the story or develop a story. Yes. Gibran's book, I don't know how many people, how many people have read it or, or even are familiar with it at all. I find, good, okay. I think that's interesting because I think, you know, of, of this generation, not many people are very familiar with it. Um, Anyway, yeah. to familiarize, familiarize you with it, it has a very slim story. Basically, the story in the book is just this guy can't leave this place. It's all very vague. And he sees his ship, and so he decides, this is it, and I'm leaving. And everybody comes to him on the way and goes, oh, because he's so beloved. Talk to us about this and this and this. And then he gets on the boat and he leaves. That's kind of it. <laughs> it's really a small story. So I needed to turn it into something larger and find a way that the story could weave in and out of all these philosophical poems. Boy, you, you can really see him in a story conference, can't you, with the storyboards behind him explaining the whole concept? Because I can't talk without using my hands. Uh, it, no, it's... You it's, put them under here and I'll, <laughs> I can't do it. Like, girl. Yeah. Boy. <laughs> uh, one question I had is on, uh, which, is, which is different from live action, because typically in a live action movie, you have one director. Yeah. And like in a Disney feature, there's oftentimes two directors. And here you were the main director with a lot of sequence directors. And right. I was wondering if you could comment on how that works. Right. Um, uh, well, basically, it was up to me to come up with a story and it was up to me to figure out which poems and how many poems to fold into it. And I knew there were several, like love and marriage and children, that have been very popular for over the years. Some people use some of those words in their wedding vows and things like that, so they've been very uh -huh. popular. And I knew I needed to include those. Uh, but otherwise, it was just a matter of trying to think of which poems would seem to come out organically out of the story so that it would feel seamless. Uh, I started off with 12, and then it, it sort of reduced to eight as demands on the story kept coming in, so the story got bigger and bigger. Uh, the story was going to be like 20 minutes, and it wound up being like 55 minutes. Um, so, you know, I picked which poems. Uh, some animators had been already approached and had agreed to do things and had been asked, oh, if you had your choice, what one would you like to do? And sometimes, so some of them wound up still in the project, you know, when I came on, and, and then we, I also got others who, you know, to fill also other empty spaces, etc. cetera. Uh, and sometimes I had to come to them and say, we're not gonna do that poem anymore. So would you, would you be agreeable to doing this other poem? So, uh, so that was a little awkward sometimes, but uh, yeah. So people did, and basically I wrote the story, I had the concept, and they were mostly free to develop their own ideas, to, to put their own stamp on it, to have their own vision, because that was kind of the intention. And that was mm -hmm. part of what I thought was really exciting about this project, is that I got to work with all these people, many of whom I've, just, I've admired for a long time, others who I was new to, but very excited to work with. So the idea was let's let them go and do their own yeah. thing and have this really be a showcase of different approaches. And also because it's poetry, that's part of the thing about poetry is people can interpret poetry so differently. So that was part of the excitement about the thing. So really I, they would present storyboards of their uh, poems before they began. I gave a few notes, mainly they were in the interest of trying to keep things flowing and graceful. And I would sometimes give suggestions, but I always said, this is, up, this is your thing, I leave it up to you. I'll toss a few suggestions out there where this is yours. 
So it was very much the individual artist's uh, intent and vision. It was very elegant. I think that kind of, because uh, someone has to see the overall view, which yeah. you do, yeah. and then gently steer these artists right. and let them have their way. And, and it speaks universally, too, because someone may go, boy, that Plimpton thing really spoke to me, and the others may not. I think you've made a very universal uh, right. approach. It is interesting, just in terms of getting people's reactions when they see it, mm -hmm. different people have, have different favorites. I mean, a lot of people say, oh... This one was my favorite. I loved the one on children, or I loved the one on marriage, or you know, people respond to different things, which I think is kind of fun. It just shows again how we're all uniquely individuals, and we do respond differently to things. Um, for me, who I'm, I'm not really. I don't understand the whole animation process, really. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but it seemed to me that. The animation had kind of a retro feeling <laughs> because the poetry is still, it's like from 1923. I'm not saying that it's not relevant now. I'm but just the language, saying that for example? the delivery of those kind of messages today are done in a whole other way, mm -hmm. you know? And so, right, right. Um, am I right or am I wrong that the, the, the animation had kind of a retro feel? Because today animation is done in a, uh, in a much more technologically advanced kind of a way. Well, it's yes, interesting. I, I mean, uh, maybe in terms of your thought about things, the pace of things, things maybe are very, very quickly paced today, I think, as a general statement. And maybe some of these things were a little more languid in their uh, timing. Um, but, oh, but also, also, there was a lot of swirling of colors and things. Well, in most animation today, things are much more precise, isn't yeah. it? I, th I think And harder edge. Okay, so, all oh, right. Yeah. Because, because of CG animation, okay. a lot of that is very crisp right. because you're building... Um, virtual 3D models. So uh, it's less like people who animate with paint or, you know what I mean, yeah. that gets these kind of smudgy edges and things like that. You know, you have, you have a character in, you know, How to Train Your Dragon and everything is very yeah. crisp yes. and the, the hair of the beards is very yes. precise. Yes. So I know what you mean. That kind of style of CG uh, is very dominant right now. Right. Um, not that it has to be. I mean, one thing I hope for this movie is that it also kind of opens people up to, oh, we can do things differently. The first poem, uh, the one on freedom, the one that has the birds and the birds yes. get attached to the tree, that was CG. That was done in CG uh, by a Polish animator. I love his stuff. And yet it looked like, uh, like pastel, you know, like really dusty, gritty pastel. Um, so I... You know, if anyone had asked me, I don't think I would have necessarily known that that was CG. It doesn't have any of that sense of, right. it doesn't look like Woods and Buddy. It, you know, it looks, you know, it, it looks like right. someone who's worked with something with texture. And um, so let's see, other, other techniques. Um, the Good and Evil, the one with the stags and the turtles, oh, which was gorgeous. done as kind of a watercolor effect. And sometimes mm -hmm. the pigments would sort of dissolve off of things. That was also CG. Uh, I mean, many of the backgrounds were watercolor painted, but then elements of them were done in CG, and they they did those effects to make things bleed and trail off. Or uh, so, you've taken the shackles off of CG. Right. You, the you idea made is, it organic. is trying to find new ways to express things, and I hope you know it'd be great if people just start feeling freer to experiment. Because uh, it doesn't have to all look the same. And I'm not saying that all the CG films look the same. They have different styles, but I know what you mean. They have a feeling of that rigidness or something. Listen, the, the new Star Wars, you know, all they talk about how they're going and doing things not really CG and they're going back to the original <laughs> a little bit and going yeah. to do, you know, the old school way. Right. Are they going to use models and things like that? Yeah. Well, Interstellar the first won the one. Oscar, right? And that was yeah. all models. Yeah. Which yeah. which one? Interstellar. Oh, that was all models. All models done by New Deal Studios. Not we that to... not that huge interior scene with all the kind of shelves and was that be a CG? 
Those, Is that a those model? Were, or? Those were projections on string. I had the, the projections effect, on string. The Oscar winner was here explaining it. Yeah, it was it was amazing. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. That's so, cool. Uh, you know, you go for CG and then some yeah. people hunker to the times when things were a little simpler and were done, you know, with little models that you did in your backyard or something <laughs> like this. And it was like very cute. I want to ask you something. Yeah. I, I don't know much about animation, but I knew the entire Paramount crew, Michael Eisner and Jeff Katzenberg from Paramount. And when mm -hmm. they moved to Disney, they really restarted the whole yep. Disney animation movies, you know, with The Little Mermaid and, all, you know, and, and it started the whole modern Disney animation movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, female leading characters, um, the songs and the music and who did them and so on and so forth. Were you there at Disney at the time? Yeah. Can I'm, you tell us a little bit about that period at Disney? Sure. Um, I started a year after Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg were put in charge of the studio. Right. So uh, I started on the movie, um, I was hired to work on Oliver and Company as a story artist. And I remember they were still finishing up um, uh, Great Mouse Detective, which was the first film done under the new regime. I see. And everybody was very nervous um, because um, Michael Eisner wasn't too sure about the animation division. Right. I think he was thinking, eh, it doesn't make any money. Why are we keeping this? Right. He was thinking of maybe trashing the whole thing. Mm. And it was, uh, Roy, well, as a businessman, that's sure, what he was thinking. Sure. But Roy Disney, who put him in that position, uh, said, oh, no, 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 no. You've got to do the animation. This is the foundation of the whole studio. Yes. We're, let's, let's do animation. But you still felt, when I started there, you still felt like if we screw up, everything's going to go down. Uh -huh. you know? And it was pretty, people were a little nervous. Um, and uh, Great Mouse Detective did well in a small way. Yeah. And I was working on Oliver and Company and that did better. It sort of lifted up a little bit. And then of course, when we did Little Mermaid, then that was a big smash and Michael didn't have to be convinced anymore. Right. Jeffrey actually, on the other hand, really got into it. Totally and got into loved it. doing totally. it. Yeah. He yeah. just got a hold of it like a dog yes. on a bone. And, yes. um, and we know when Katzenberg gets a bone, that's it. He'll never let go. He'll never let go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he was passionate about it. I mean, in the beginning, he didn't know anything about animation. So it was, um, it was challenging, you know, Yeah, and working for a guy does, who doesn't know about it. Okay, so you were a story artist, right? What does it exactly mean? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know how... Are you all focused on animation? Are you no. interested in different areas of filmmaking yes. and all of that? Cool. Yes. Okay. So in animation, for those who don't know, um, sometimes we'll start with a script. Not always. Sometimes it's just an idea. Uh, and the storyboard is basically like comic form, visualizing the whole film. Sometimes you've, you're given script pages and you, you visualize how the scenes will play out. You visualize how the camera would move. You visualize where it's set. You come up with gags, visual ideas, and you and you draw them out on, you know, little little pieces of paper like so, and you pin them up on a board, and then you can pitch the whole story, you know, present it, and people can get a sense of the pacing and how well the sh how the scenes are playing. As I said, sometimes you're illustrating a script, other times there's just an idea, and you go ahead and you invent it, and then dialogue is added in and. It's also a very collaborative process. So someone might write, then you would draw, and then someone would, you know, draw. You know, it's back and forth. So the whole movie ultimately is done on these panels. And once they're approved, then the storyboard panels were, would be filmed, cut with scratch voices, meaning not professional actors, but everybody in the studio who had any sort of talent for that would record the lines. And it would be cut together, and you do a rough version of the film. Oh, wow. So the film would be shown, you know, these scenes would just be still drawings, but cut together to give a sense of what was happening. And uh, it's amazing how much you can tell from that. You can actually, you can actually get emotional watching a draw, you know, a film made up of stills. 
I, I think I it's interesting. I had a question from a, a, a student recently who loves animated films like mm -hmm. this. And she did ask me, do I have to be an animator to direct an animated film? Right. Um, people come to it from different areas. Um, people have been animators. I have to say, a lot of people come from story, from the story departments, um, because I think working in, as a story artist, you not only are you involved with performance, but you're involved with the rhythm of the whole process of storytelling. And let's face it, that's what a movie is, is you're telling a story. So you get a sense of rhythm and pacing. You, you feel where something needs to be tightened up or something needs to be stronger or something needs to be shortened. So basically that's editing, that's writing. So I think story artists often get a real sense of how to build a story, even though they might be only working on different sequences, mm -hmm. because you're also working together and you're working engaged with that process. So I know a lot of story artists, uh, Kirk and Gary, who did uh, Beauty and the Beast and, and other films, and uh, they were story artists. And Brenda Chapman, who did Brave, she was a story artist. And mm -hmm. Chris Sanders, who did um, the How to Train Your Dragon, and Lilo and Stitch, and um, uh, Dean Dublin, they were story artists. Actually, we were all working together at Disney. Wow. It was really a great bunch of yeah. people, I have to say. Uh, what a nice gathering of people. And we were all friends, and it's it's an interesting, at least at Disney, it always felt like a very collaborative kind of thing. We'd so show let me each ask you board. something. I finally understand actually what you're doing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> beside directing yeah. one of the greatest movies, animated movie, but. Um, so, can you, to continue his question, can you be a director of an animated movie, um, but you're not an artist, you can't really draw it. So you have ideas and you give it to somebody who draws the whole thing for you. Can you come and do that or not really? Has there been a case of that being done? Or do you I'm trying have to think. To I can't think of, I cannot think of anyone well. who did not start as an artist. That's not to say it's not possible. Right. But so much of it is our aesthetic decisions. Yes. You know, and if you're going to be the last word, you're going to be the last judge on something. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't an artist, you would have to depend on the artists that you'd hire around you to be right. that for you. Right. And I think it's possible. Right. That's possible. Right. Yeah, well, but, I suppose if you have taste, like like you go to art galleries all the time, you could probably say, I want this sequence to look like Bierstadt or something like that, yeah. and that would... Right. Uh, well, right. directors do that sometimes. They hire, you know, people to storyboard scenes. Art directors. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's interesting. By the way, what you told me about that when you write the story and you basically draw it out and then you actually have a whole sense and a vision of the movie. It reminds me that we had here um, what the editor of Birdman. And he said that, you know, because it's all Did they storyboard at all for that? They, Excuse me, just don't. Stop they not only story, but but they basically shot. They did a rehearsal of all the shooting with the handheld, and they're going in and going out, and the, the and choreography so of that, yeah. the choreography of it. The editors was on the set with the director and so on and so forth, and they shot it, and that was their guide yeah. to then shooting the movie. Mm -hmm. Especially with that movie, because of the I continuous know. camera continuous, work. Yeah. <laughs> but that's and, interesting. And the other thing that is, was interesting about that is the movie looks like it's one long shot and there's yeah. no cuts. Yeah. He said a hundred cuts. He said that many? A hundred cuts, but they really worked a lot Very clever. to diffuse it. Yeah. I was aware of maybe four or five, <laughs> but certainly not a hundred. hundred. That was one of the most wow. inter yeah, interesting things. It's interesting. Now, I know Walt Disney started the whole practice of storyboarding. Yes. 
But other directors have certainly taken it up. And many live action movies also use yeah. storyboarding. Yeah. George Lucas used storyboarding a lot. Alfred Hitchcock used mm -hmm. storyboarding a lot. I think also when you're planning out, especially planning out big action scenes, yes. it's very expensive to shoot things and then have, yes. a have it be a mistake. I mean, if you're really going to do it, especially the more CG effects that are in there, it's basically yeah. like doing an animated movie, right? Because you're just creating this stuff from scratch and you really have to plan everything out. It's a great planning tool. Who else is involved in that process? You are the story artist. Is there an animator who then Once gets every scene and basically slices it and dices? <laughs> well, the editor slices and dices it, separates it into scenes, and then those scenes, well, they're designed, you know, the, the backgrounds and, and the way the scene moves is designed first. So that's what's called the layout artist. The layout artist. So you de design your layout. Uh, what the background will be, how the character will move through the background, the camera move. Then, and, and there'll be some character suggestion poses to see how the character fits in there. Then that folder is handed off to the animator. So now the, also, you would have in the meantime recorded the voice talent uh, and you'd cut it together in the reel, you know, the actual voice talent and you know it, it starts to work. So then when you've got you know, the soundtrack and you've got the layout, then you hand that over to the animator. And as the director, then you talk to him about what the scene is and what's happening and how it relates to the rest of the movie and what's the emotional intention of the scene. Um, and then, you know, that's what the animator gets and they go off and... It's like doing a Broadway musical. Stuff it's very much like doing a Broadway musical. As a matter of fact, Howard Ashman who was the, the lyricist for Little Mermaid yes. and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, he gave a lecture, I remember, at Disney. Uh, and he compared the art of doing Broadway musicals and doing uh, animated films, especially animated films that have music in them. And he said the process is so similar. So, so similar. not that stupid. Not that stupid. Not that no. Come now. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Anyway, now I understand a lot more Good. about how... It's done because it it's was a, very a broken mystery, down. A yeah, mystery. it's really not very mysterious, though. Yeah. Should we ask the uh, student? Do you have another question? No. Let's uh, let's get uh, someone from the audience. And while you're walking up, uh, Roger shared that some of the animation you saw on that screen was actually clay animation painted on glass. I think, right? Right. The the one that has it, it looked like oil paintings that kept changing. The one on work. Uh, she actually works with colored clay rather than paint and she has all these colored clays and she mixes them Like you would blend paint and she applies it with her finger. She paints with her finger. So everything is done You know on a board and she'll paint the image, you know take the frame of film and then adjust the image and add more and add more and it changes and it builds and it builds very labor-intensive she said she you know she did it all with this finger she said up to a point and then that finger was just ruined. So then she shifted to her second finger. And then she said when that was started killing her, she'd try her third, but her third, she said, wasn't really very good. No. But really amazingly uh, labor intensive. All right. Yeah. I was wondering, so I know you said that all of the, uh, all of this poems were supposed to be like, they, they basically looked like they were, you know, hand drawn or hand, whatever. I know some of them weren't like the ones you mentioned, but I was just wondering what made you decide to do the main story as the um, computer animation with a painted background rather than more similar to the poems? Good question. Um, I didn't. In oh. the very beginning, no, just to give you the background on this, I was asked, what kind of style would you like to do? What would you like to do? And I said, I would love to do a traditional animated film again. I'd love to do, you know, regular traditional hand-drawn animation. So that's what we did. We started off, we worked through a, a company in Canada, which basically sort of farmed out to animators around the world. And they animated by hand. And we got six months into it and realized we were so far behind schedule <laughs> and so getting so far over budget, we were not going to be able to complete the film. And it was a big 
it was a terrible time. <laughs> it was sort of like, is this all going to crash and burn? And after a lot of uh, examining of what our options were and where else we could go to get things done, it was decided really the only way to get the film finished, because we weren't going to get any more budget or any more time, uh, was to do the character animation as CG. So that in that way there would be uh, you know no cleanup and that sort of thing. So we went with a, a studio up in Canada in Vancouver, um, and they had uh, they they were aware of a process called toon shading, where mm -hmm. you do your CG animation, you have your CG characters, and uh, and then it's put through this program, which basically the computer program recognizes the edges and assigns a line to it. And it basically it flattens it all out. So the animator works with a C, 3D CG character. 3D is a little misleading. You know, and, and then the, the program flattens it back out. And then what we did after that is I had a team of traditional animators go back in on top and then finesse it. Because wow. sometimes, sometimes the animators had done a beautiful job with their CG characters but and let me tell you, translating our original graphically drawn flat, you know, 2D characters into CG models was just the most hellish job. <laughs> God, it was awful. Anyway, so we went through that. And, uh, but sometimes the animators would do a beautiful job, but in the process of the tune shading, sometimes details would get lost. You know, either the shapes weren't big enough to be recognized to create a line. Right. So... These guys, headed up by a guy from Disney, Nick Ranieri, who, you know, animated Hades and lots of other cool characters. Anyway, he came in and headed up a group. They went back in, finessed the characters, added extra stuff. Uh, we didn't have really very uh, complicated models in terms of clothing and everything. They went back in and added more follow-through and wrinkles and shapes. and So it had this, it was a really strange process process and, and it was all out of necessity trying to because we weren't going to change the backgrounds it was still my intent to have the whole thing look like i wanted it to look like ink drawings with it watercolor you succeeded yes. thank you i yes. hope so <laughs> yeah no, it so. Does. that's why i said it really felt like it was yeah retro retro yeah so okay. yes thank you for asking that because it was quite a a crazy process and um yeah just Quickly, changing. which was the first uh, traditional style that you were trying to do, but then... What was which, what? Which traditional style of animation were you trying to do originally? Like, which traditional yeah, style? Yeah, I mean, like, which, like, hand drawing or... Yeah, like hand drawn. Okay. Yeah, so like a traditional, you know, like back in mm -hmm. Disney pre-CG days, uh, hand drawn. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm not an animation student, so I don't know any No, that's okay. No, I just need to define the terms, yeah. I guess. Um, All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank yeah, you very much. CG tends to have that puppet look and that, that squash it, and stretch it can. the drawing. It can. I mean, really good CG. Of course, we're seeing really good CG these days. And, yeah, yeah. And they get a lot of stretch and squash and everything yeah. in it. But, yeah. <laughs> it was great. And Thank it you. it helps so much with the car and stuff where you don't have to worry about the perspective. Well, that's true. Well, the car was CG. Yeah. Hello, my name is Katja. I'm from the producing program. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for such a great, ephemeral, creative work. It was really amazing i loved it uh, i was actually wondering on a different note how you approach story and kind of grab on to the tail of the story and your process in that mm -hmm. i know it might be a bit of a big question uh, but i was really so curious. you're asking me how i how i created the story out of what yeah was and, there how, in the book, well, and how you approach story how generally I... like approach i presume you have like a way you deal with story <laughs> I wish I had a real method to <laughs> my madness. Um, I have to say, and in all the ways I work, I'm mostly kind of an intuitive person. I mean, I do think things out. It's not like I have no rational brain, but um, a lot of it is just things come to me. I visualize things and I dream about it, kind of, you know, awake dream about it and see what comes up. I mean, in terms of in terms of this story, as I, I think I said, there was a very minor story in the book. And in order to flesh it out, I, I was asking myself, all right, 
here's Mustafa. He's in this, why is he stuck here? In the book, he said, he, actually in the book, they said he was there 12 years and couldn't leave, but they don't say why. And I was like, well, why is he stuck there? So I tried to think of, well, what reason, what would keep you there? Certainly ships must come and go. So I had the thought that, I had also done some research on Gibran. He had also written some uh, poems. He was born in Lebanon, but came to the U.S. when he was about 12 with his mother and sister. They lived in Boston, and then later he lived in New York. Uh, Lebanon at that part of time was part of the Ottoman Empire. And from his distant vantage point in the U.S., he watched the political machinations going on there. And he wrote critical pieces about what was going on there, and one of which was, that qu was the poem that I quoted in the movie. I gave that to Mustafa, and that was actually a Gibran poem that he had written you know, uh, about the Ottomans uh, and what was going on in his country. Um, so I thought, all right, stealing a little bit from Gibran for Gibran, I, I said, all right, I'll, I'll make Mustafa a, a political prisoner. You know, he's expressed mm. uh, his ideas about something, and he's gotten on the bad side of the authorities, and they've, they've, lo they've put him under house arrest. I was also thinking of uh, her name, An yeah. Soon Chi. That's what I was thinking. Am I, were yeah. you? Yeah, I was. Cool. And I'm always bad with her name, but I always was so impressed with her. I think she was under house arrest for 15-something yeah. yeah. years for expressing her, her opinions about trying to democratize her country. So, you know, I thought, it's timeless. You know, people are often, generally, the, the, the philosophers, the peacemakers are the ones who probably get it the worst. I don't know. But I thought that was a, that could be a motive, that could be a reason why he was... There. And also I thought, all oh, right, if it's a house arrest, then he's up in a house, up on a mountain, and he can look over the sea and be philosophical, and it can be kind of his, his monk's retreat as well as his imprisonment, right? So yeah. It also was, uh, after college, I went traveling with a friend through Europe, and we wound up in Crete, and I wound up living in Crete for a year. Oh, oh wow. And uh, <laughs> for a little while in a cave, and... Uh, Another little, little time in a, in a little little house, a very rustic house, no electricity or anything. So I pulled a lot on my experience of living in Crete. Also, it being a Mediterranean country, I thought this won't be so far off from Gibran's origins as well. So a lot of stuff, you know. You, so as a process, getting back to your question, I pull from current events. I ask myself questions about the characters. You know, why are they doing this? Um, in their situation, what would be meaningful to them? What would other people's relationships be to them? Um, you know, I, I thought originally, I thought the first idea that came up was, of course, he would have a guard and that they would be friends, that that would be a place where he could be, uh, one place he could talk about things. Originally, the, the freedom poem was to be shared between him and... Uh, um, the guard. The guard. Halim. Halim. Isn't that terrible? All of a sudden his name went out of my head. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, Halim. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Hi, Mr. Ellers. My Hi. name is Anuja, Anuja, and I am a live action filmmaking directing student and doing my MFA. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm the student that Mark was referring to. Oh. Um, <laughs> I love animation. I grew up watching all of your films, and they inspired me, and I want to do what you do. I want to do what you did. Um, but Mark was telling me that it takes like a warehouse full of people to do a traditional 2D animation. And I think they're so beautiful and I think it's a dying art. So where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> to do feature films, you want to do traditional uh, feature films? I can start even small. I just want to know where to start. <laughs> well, yeah, people can start small. I, I'll use an example. The guy who uh, animated the poem on love, Tom Moore, he has a studio, he's Irish, he has a studio in Kilkenny, Ireland. And I know the way he started out was doing little films, right? Little stuff. And built his way up. He did a feature, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it was called The Secret of Kells, which was a, a lovely animated film about a monk, you know, uh, back in, I don't know what it was, like the 1200s, a boy living in a monastery where this... Uh, uh, illuminated Bible was, and it was all about, 
you know, drawing these imaginative pictures. And, you know, in those Bibles, they did all these things with the sort of Celtic knots and things like that, beautiful stuff. And he did, a, you know, an animated feature like that. And they had a, it's a pretty small studio, I'd have to say. And I think they wound up having to use some other people. You can start small and gather people to you. And I think before setting out to do a feature, set out to do something small. I mean, many people do just um, shorts, you know. Um, Bill Plimpton, who did the one on eating and drinking, he does his own films. I mean, he has done features, but he does shorts. And it's basically him and like two other people. Um, so you could get experience that way and, and find your find your way through it, find your, uh, how you like to express yourself and... Well, there's animator, animation students here, befriend them and see if you can do something together. You bring that something that you're good at, they'll bring something that they're good at. You have resources here. You have people who study cinematography, you have people who, you know, could do sound, you have animator. It's the most incredible resource center. Mm -hmm. the school. Start there. I hope Thank that's you. some sort of an answer for you. <laughs> it says, get don't give going. up on thinking, it don't give up on thinking going. about doing, start. doing feature films, but yes, yeah, start, start somewhere and uh, do stuff, do stuff and get Jonah the feel Hill for was it. here and he had one advice. Yeah. Keep doing stuff. Keep doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's it. Thank right? you. Sure. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Laura. I'm from the producing department. Hi, Laura. Um, you said that most people that direct animation films are people that actually draw and actually are involved in those. And we have screenwriting classes and they tell us do not write an animation film because if you're not in Disney, if you're not in Pixar, you're not going to be able to sell it. So I wanted to ask, from a producer perspective, how would you convince a producer to invest in your project and, and say, yes, I'm going to do it, I'm going to fall in love with your project, and I'm going to do it no matter if I'm not in a big studio? Right. Um, well, it's all about coming up with an idea that gets people excited um, and finding a way of expressing it simply. Um, if you have an opportunity to, to get, you know, your idea in front of somebody, it needs to be really concise. It, it needs to uh, it needs to have something in it that feels strong. You know, it's either an emotion or it's a new way of looking at something. That's what will catch people's attention, right? Um, they're not, you know, a lot of times they're not going to have the time to sit and read a, a long script or a long presentation. I hate to say that, but that's kind of the reality of things. Uh, most of the time, you just have to get somebody excited about an idea. At Disney, there used to be a, a thing, uh, like they called it the gong show, kind of after that TV show where if you came up and acted and they rang the gong and they didn't like you, you just get jerked off. So um, uh, one of those pitch sessions, people would bring their ideas, Mike Gabriel just did a quick drawing. He, he did basically a drawing of Tiger Lily from, from Peter Pan and wrote on a title, Pocahontas, an American princess. <laughs> and he brought it to it, and that was all he brought. Boom, this picture, Pocahontas, an American princess. And that was it. And Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg went, that's it. Because I think, now it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not saying we'll make another princess movie. What I'm saying is the idea was simple and strong and they could understand it as, okay, there are princess movies out there, but this one is different. This one deals with a, a you know, a, an historical character, even though she's practically mythological. And, uh, you know, and it has a, it has a, a new view to it. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. It's just come up with ideas and uh, find a way to, to present them and craft them in a simple way, and you'll have more opportunity to get through to somebody. Then, you know, 
If you have a script in your back pocket, cool. But, you know, getting in the door is the first thing, I think. Would that be like your concept art for Tron, right? Uh, just right. You stills and paintings? And right, right. It sells the project. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a piece of artwork. Sometimes it's just an idea. You know, it's just a concept. Somebody comes in with a concept and it, it excites people. I mean, it is, it's, that's the thing about this business is probably the people who are in the position to make a movie, they're very busy and, you know, you just want to get something in there to get them excited. You know, I just saw a trailer for Nancy Meyers' uh, movie called um, uh, The Intern. Mm -hmm. Right. And, right. You know, and it's a very simple concept. Basically, it's Anne Hathaway, I guess, is in charge of some program and somebody said, we have this senior, we have this um, program, new program, very exciting. We're bringing seniors to work here and help. And she said, this is so great, high school senior. And he said, no, no. senior. <laughs> senior and here citizen. comes Bob, yeah, Bobby De Niro yeah. <laughs> as an intern, you know, after the age of retirement. Right. And anyway, and of course, at the beginning she resisted and then of course right. he becomes a best friend and the best thing that happened to them and so on and so forth and it's right. just a very simple idea you know yeah. it's a one-line idea but it excited people they saw it and the trailer it was like very clear what's going right. on right right yeah thank you thank you for coming sure thanks hi um uh, my name is robert from nifa summer school and from what, from what? Uh, nifa summer school camp Summer and, school. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, what was your main, what were your biggest challenges, and how did you actually, um, um, what's it called? Overcome them. Overcome them. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And um, yeah, how how do you think it's best to overcome challenges as an artist? Okay, as an artist. Okay. Um, well, in the making of this film, you mean specifically on the profit? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this one was challenging because it was a small uh, budget, short schedule, so I knew that whatever I did, whatever concepts I came up with, I'm going to, I would have to be creative in order to solve them. I mean, I, I kind of got myself out on a limb where I thought up big crowd scenes and they're all fighting and there are lots of people and I thought, uh oh, what am I doing? <laughs> but I thought, you know, I will think up some sort of solution in or in a way to express it that maybe will be a simpler way. Uh, so that was one of the challenges. Uh, quite frankly, you know, there was the challenge of developing a story and then also having a producers who would come in and then they would have different ideas of things that they wanted. So sometimes Sometimes it's a, it's a creative uh, friction that's great and it leads you to a good new idea. And then sometimes it feels like it's something taking, taking the story off course. So that's also, that's a challenge as an artist to work with uh, executives or producers and their ideas and their opinions. And you need to work creatively and constructively with people and keep a good relationship and then at the same time you have to kind of hold your ground when you feel like that you know the essence of something is going to going to get pushed off center you know that's always very tricky yeah. um, very tricky and of course all everybody when they start wanting to be creative and when they are creative you immediately, your ideas, you get a lot of investment in them. So people get very passionate about it. So it's negotiating those sort of um, personal things is, is, can be very hard. Um, I think in terms of working together with other people on things too, it's always important to think, think about the project as opposed to, well, this is my idea and this is his idea and that's her idea, but let's, you know, forget about whose ideas it is. Let's just, we'll throw ideas in there, but let's always think about the project as like a third person so we don't have to get too possessive about our own ideas because it's always good to listen and get things out. Right. That's one thing I loved about uh, working in the story at Disney. It was always whew, 
throw stuff off the top of your head. Don't edit yourself. It's, it's a stupid idea. That's okay. We're all going to come up with stupid ideas. So part of the creative process is not editing yourself when you're in the process, right? And if you're working with somebody else, try to create an atmosphere where, all right, let's work together and let's just come up with ideas and yeah, we'll find a way to trim it down. But when you're thinking up things, when you're being creative, try not to cut yourself off at the very beginning, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, All thanks. right. Thank you. I'm sure I'll think of something else when you've sat down. But. I am Jeremy from the summer camp in advanced filmmaking. I'm from Paris. Huh. And we really respect your movie in France. And this Thank one you. is pretty amazing. I got a question for you that... How does spiritual thing in life inspire you to do this movie? Mm -hmm. The question is, how did it? How does like spiritual f thing, you know, inspire you to do this movie? Because I think you can find so many spiritual like thing in the movie that's like really touched you in the bottom of the heart. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a big question. Give me a minute. Uh, <laughs> right. I think you were. Oh, I'm sorry. I think no, you, were, okay. you were quoted in the, on the internet. I think before you did the Lion King. I think your father had passed just before that picture. Yeah, yeah. And that informed a lot of your creative decisions on that picture. Yeah, I, in, and probably almost more in an unconscious way than even in a conscious way. Uh huh. Um, this one, I was given the book when I was in college, and um, to tell you the truth. One of the first times I ever sat down to read it was with a friend. We were just reading through the book and reading it out loud, which is an interesting thing to do if you're reading stuff that's more poetic. It's always interesting to hear it. And I have to say, before we even got through the whole book, I had a profound experience. And it was very much, I don't know how to describe it. And it gets really corny sounding, so forgive it. But it was kind of like a consciousness boom, expanding thing where... At one point, all of a sudden, I just felt profoundly like I related to everything. I just, like in the room, there was a brick in a bookcase. It was like, that brick, I felt related to it, and the window, and the stars outside, and I just felt this profound thing. And I know other people have talked about these kind of things, you know. For me, I use the word satori. It's a little, in meditation, or sometimes in Zen practice, sometimes the, you know, like the Zen master will come and kind of, give you a little bit of a whack on the shoulder and they kind of get <laughs> bunk, you get bunked into this sort of consciousness or something. It's kind of what I felt like in that. Anyway, it was profound for me. And I've always carried that with me. So um, that for me was one of the things that drove me uh, right away to do this movie. But there are many other things. Um, obviously, this movie, uh, one of the issues in it deals with death and I have to say that that's kind of a that's a theme that's always been uh, interesting to me. I mean, really, when you look at Lion King, that was a movie largely about death. I mean, about many things, but you know, about losing a loved one, losing a parent, trying to figure out where you are in this life. You know, when you feel disconnected. Uh, but that whole thing of feeling reassurance, you know, when you're separated like that, and. I don't know if you saw The Little Match Girl. I did an animated short of Hans Christian Andersen's story uh, several years back. Um, if, I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but it's basically the story of a dying girl. It's, it's the story of a, a beggar girl who, only, who sells matches and is freezing to death at night, and she keeps lighting oh, her matches yeah. to stay warm and has these visions in the, in the glow of the match. So, and this movie deals with that too. I find that subject really interesting and I'm drawn to it, but always in a way of sort of like, I'm drawn to it as, you know, explore it and, and, and to speak about kind of that it's not, it, that death isn't the end. This is, this is my own yeah. personal message, is that it's not the end, that there's more beyond it, that this, uh, as, as Gibran says, we, we are more than what we know. Um, actually, this is the last line I wanted to use in the movie, but wasn't able to because the producers wanted to do a different one. Here's one of those disagreements. The last line in Gibran's book is, um, let's see, a little while, a rest upon the wind, and another woman shall bear me. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Right. There is Gibran talking about 
It sounds like reincarnation to me. Totally. Completely. He said it in the movie, too. He says it in the movie in the context of the, the goodbye speech. Yes. And he does that in the book as well. But at the very end of the book, and then as the ship is sailing away, uh, Almitra is hearing in, you know, a little while, a rest upon the wind. And I always thought, oh, that's so profound. Yeah. But uh, I wanted that to be the last line in the movie, but it isn't. So that's one of those things. There, you know, there are things, of course, that are very um, meaningful to me that I, since it's my movie, I get to stick in there most of the time. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you so much. Sure, really. thanks. There's a, there was a lot done in Paris in that movie. Oh, yeah? The Brizzi brothers who did Death uh, worked in Paris. And um, the piece on uh, Good and Evil, though it was directed um, by um, Mohammed uh, Harib, it was done at the uh, Mikros studio. The Mikros studio that does um, Asterix. And they did that watercolory kind of uh, thing of Good and Evil. Yeah. So a lot of work there. And a lot of the storyboarding was done in Paris, uh, the Brizzi brothers. I worked with them in L.A., and then they had to return to Paris, and then we did it online. A lot of this movie was done <laughs> over Skype. <laughs> wow. Really? We had like a little three-room office in Santa Monica, and I had a big screen in my room, and so wow. much of it was done over Skype because the char you know, character designers in Berlin and the art directors in Berlin and... There's animators in Ireland and animators, you know, in... Uh, yeah, that's how the Minion studio works, because when you're going to bed, they're waking up there. Yeah, and that's tough. When you're spread that far, coordinating times is, is hard. Anyway, next question. Hi, my name's Kate. I'm in the three-week filmmaking summer camp here. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what it was like to work with Liam Neeson as a voice actor. You know what? I only had two days to work with him which is really short for a film. But to his credit, he is so professional and so good. He came in and in one day we recorded all of his dialogue and there was a lot of dialogue for that character. And um, yeah, he was great. I mean, he has a beautiful voice for one thing, but we would do, you know, maybe no more than six takes ever on a line. And the next day he came back and we did all the reading of the, the poems of the chapters. And uh, he was so prepared. Obviously, he's really familiar with the book. Now, I had edited some of those poems down because time-wise, some of the poems are a bit long. So I had edited Gibran's poems sometimes. He came in and when we were recording, he was just doing them almost from memory because he knew the whole original poem. And I had to say, well, no, we have to look, look at the <laughs> script because it's a little shorter. Uh, <clears throat> but his his reading of the poetry I found so uh, what's the word I don't know it was just it was so intense it was so uh, astute I, we would do maybe three or four versions one right after the other and there was just no need for me to even give any kind of guidance he would just do slightly different interpretations and they were beautiful I think the guy should record you know, recorded poetry or something. I loved listening to his recordings. Uh, great sensitivity and uh, and something maybe he doesn't get to do very often now. He seems like he's kind of fallen into the... Uh, action mode. The action <laughs> movie and, you know, it's all like quick over here is, you know, what does he get to do? Maybe or, he can combine Not the with two, my daughter. Right? What? Can you combine the two in some way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, because he can be a really sensitive artist. And, yeah, he was uh, a pleasure to work with. We had great voice actors. I had so much fun. I, well, I'm so lucky. A lot of that came from uh, Salma's relationships with these actors, that they would come and agree to do it. Uh, uh, John Reese davies uh, who, who just did The Cafe Owner, he's, you know, he's, um, he's Gimli of the, of the Lord of the Rings dwarfs and uh, also the guy in uh, Indiana Jones, you know, Indy! Oh, bad dates. You know that guy? <laughs> you know? He's great. As a matter of fact, at the end of our recording session, he said, okay, here's a few freebies for you. And he started rattling off lines from his pictures. <laughs> I have it on tape. It's recorded somewhere. It's great. But so much fun. And then he would in, you know, ad-lib like crazy. It is fun to get people who ad-lib. Uh, 
Yeah, because you never know what's going to come up. You never know what comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Hi, sir. Hi. Uh, Thank you for coming. My name is Aina, and I'm from China. Um, So uh, in China, a lot of fans will love your animations, especially Lion King. Oh, thanks. Uh, like when we were young in China, we just opened China to international world, so we didn't have a lot of animations. Mm. But Lion King was one of them, and so you can imagine those Chinese little kids—they they watch it <laughs> several times. Oh, so thanks. I will tell my friend I have a class with you. That they will get very jealous of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is about um poetry and movie. Uh, I'm a filmmaker here. I want to um. I'm so nervous to talk with you. Oh, okay. I want worry. to make my movie look like a poetry, but technically there are different languages. So my question would be, when you transfer a poem into a movie, how did you do that? And what's the difference uh, between transfer a tr- drama into a movie and transfer a m- poem into a movie? Yeah, interesting. I think... Um well, everything's always open to interpretation, I guess. You can you can do a dramatic scene many different ways. And poetry in itself is probably open to even more interpretations. Um, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, the difference between doing drama and poetry. Is drama about conflict and poetry is maybe... Fluid, more. There could be uh, conflict in poetry too. Yeah. It's interesting. There's so many different kinds of poems. I, I think there's maybe not as much difference as I was starting to think, <laughs> in that you have to respond to the material as a filmmaker. Whether it's drama, you have to figure out how you're going to express it. You know, in what what are you going to have your characters? How you're going to film them? What is it going to look like? What's the color palette? And poetry is kind of the same way, except it's just so much more, it can be so much more abstract. Like the filmmakers in our film were given free reign to interpret it as they, as they would. So, for example, uh, Micha Sosha, who did the one on freedom, in, decided to do it as birds. You know, no one told him to use birds. Uh, and it, it spoke very strongly to him. I, I love that poem. Um, it's a very personal thing. I think that's the thing that's is so excited about being a filmmaker is you get to follow, you get to express how you respond to something. Um, it's very hard to tell you how one does it. <laughs> um, but I think in one way, poetry is, you're very free in one way. I mean, it's up to you how you would like to interpret it. Uh, it's like music in a way. I mean, you take a piece of music and you want to make a film that expresses that music, it's very open to interpretation. So uh, as a filmmaker, it's, it's all kind of come from you. I, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's such an abstract question in a way, I almost don't know where to yeah, go. Thank you. Uh, when I watch this movie, I feel I'm just in a poetry. I think you're a poetic who, who is writing a poem with your animation. Oh, thank you. thank you. But there are also many, many poets working in, in this one, you know, not just me, but thank you. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Eva Luna, and hi. I was in a BFA animation before coming here. Mm-hmm. And I was so impressed by all the different animation styles in the movie. Um, do you think there's a space for this kind of artistic animation in the animation industry? I should hope so. I should hope so. I mean, I think, I think there's, there are starting to be more and more interpretations of animation now. I do think it's opening up. I mean, um, it just has to be. I, I, I mean, I see examples like, like Tom Moore's films, like maybe they don't get as, as, as big a dis- distribution as, as something like the Pixar films or, you know, or DreamWorks. But, um, Yes, of course, there's room. Uh, and I think, well, I don't know, I'll ask everyone here. Uh, would everyone be open to seeing films, you know, animated films, in different styles than what they've seen?
previously? Or is it more reassuring to see something that's very solid and, and familiar? Would, you know, or, or would people feel open to seeing a, a whole story expressed in a different style? I think, I think audiences would be open yes. to it. Yes, I mean, there's the Japanese yeah. animation, which is different. And when I saw the, some of the French ones, mm -hmm. they were so different and amazing. Yeah. I think, yes. Yeah. I, I think it's music videos have been a great outlet for that because anything goes. The 80s were great for that. My God, you'd have puppets and things and bananas yeah. and I animated peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. It's just like, um, uh, oh, uh, Laika up in uh, Portland, oh, yeah. which is doing all these puppet films now. I mean, puppet films, that was pretty obscure, uh, pretty obscure animation form. But they have been continuously putting out these puppet films, animated puppet films. I think they're really cool. I, I think they're getting a pretty good response. Maybe they're not as, getting as strong a response as some of the others. But uh, And Tim Burton, of course, from Disney. Yeah. Right. Well, and Tim Burton kind of kicked that off with Nightmare Before Christmas and right. really kind of gave it a charge. I hope so. Um, I don't know. How, how does everyone in here feel? Like, the, when to see something different? Yeah, okay. Cool. <laughs> That's the new generation. Yeah. They'll do it. They'll do it. Yeah. They'll get it done. <laughs> okay, the last one. Last but not least. Hello, my, uh, my name is Zach. Um, I am in a free week digital filmmaking. And uh, yeah, I want to try to keep this question quick. Um, um, a lot of people confuse, well, I know some people confuse animation, like some animated movies are for kids, and obviously that sounds stupid, but how do you keep films like this and The Lion King as like family movies rather than just kids' movies? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with what, what the stories are about. If you can bring in elements of story that deal with things that are not, not, just, not just amusing, childish things. I, I hate to say childish. I, it's so... It's so derogatory in a way because because <laughs> I love silly things. I mean, I like SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> you know, my son and I loved that one of the first movie. We just howled over it. So so I mean, it can be stupid and it'd be fun. But I think you know things. I guess it's I think you know what are some of the issues or things your your story are talking about. I think I think that that opens it up to more of an audience. I when when what, we were South at, Park and yes. Family Guy and sure Archer, one of my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we worked at Disney in, in story, we rarely tried to think about who our audience was. To tell you the truth, we really just tried That's to right. amuse ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you can't know what someone else is going to like. Yeah. I mean, that's all you can do. You can amuse yourself. You can do something you think feels good, something that makes you feel something, you know, a scene that makes you sad or, or a character that makes you laugh. And, you know, if it makes you feel that way, then you think, well, all right, I'm amused. You know, <laughs> I hope everybody else is. Uh, oh, well, that's hard. So you didn't have the demographic police come and say, we need a, we need a donkey movie this year. Well, <laughs> I... <laughs> I mean, there, there's sometimes there are those influences going on in studios, uh, but no, mostly, you know, all the artists who work together were all basically trying to amuse themselves, uh, and we did plenty. Uh, that's, I think, the only way you can work, because otherwise you're reaching for something you don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah. I don't know how you can be rooted in something if it's not personal, you know, mm. if you don't have a response to it. I, I, do, I, I hate the category of animation just all being for kids. I think that's, I think that's very frustrating for me. Certainly that attitude isn't held in, you know, in Asia and it's not held in Europe. I think it's really very much a particularly an American mm. kind of uh, prejudice, quite honestly. Um, and I think there are many adults who enjoy, you know, a lot of these films too, you know, even if they're uh, kind of nominally for children, you know, if they're well made. Yeah. If they're well made and they're entertaining and they actually have, sometimes have a little substance, I think, why can't it be for adults yeah. too? But I think even more adult content would be fine too. You know? Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot.
Thank you so much sure. for coming here. And I think that uh, certainly I think we got a little much more, we got more understanding of Good. what animation is and the uh -huh. process of it. Right? Oh, absolutely. No, you know. But <laughs> no, but he completely fooled me. I thought I thought the bulk of it was yes. all drawn. I mean, yes. to have the have it be CGI and then the flattening it with the tune shader, it was yeah. it was yeah. impeccable. Oh, absolutely impeccable. Thanks. It it was a, a little. It, we were a little nervous at first because we didn't really know how it was going to look. You know, yeah. they had done a test, and we thought, well, maybe. So it's when you throw your lot in with something, it can be a little. Wracking, well, but, thank yeah, you so it. much for coming. I'm Thanks. sure a few people here maybe are inspired to maybe try their hands on something like that. And, um, you know, it's always good to see a pro here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.